This evening we're going to continue on as we're looking in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, and starting at verse 1. And it says, Now after the Sabbath, at the first day of the week, began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, and came and rolled back the stone from the door, and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothes as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him, and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come, see the place where the, where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and ran to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Now, while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them, the disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And, and this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. May God bless the, the reading of his word. You know, it's an amazing how the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us such courage. It gives us strength, the power of knowing the one who was dead and is risen. And knowing the reality of that impacts our lives profoundly. As when we believe on Jesus, we too receive, if you like, his resurrection power into our lives. On May, on May Day 1990, a parade took place in Moscow's Red Square. The Soviet Union were displaying off their military might. As the parade passed by their Soviet leader, Michael Gorbachev, some Orthodox priests lifted a huge eight-foot-tall crucifix into the air of Jesus Christ. As they did this, the figure of Jesus obscured the giant posters or with faces on of Karl Marx, Frederick Ingalls and Vladimir Lenin. And at that precise moment, one of the priests shouts out in a loud voice, Mikhail Gorbachev, Christ is risen. What an incredible moment. The founders of communism are all dead, but Christ is risen. And these priests did that because the resurrection gives courage. It gives confidence. It gives boldness to stand out for the Lord Jesus Christ and proclaim him in the face of adversity. And the angel in verse 6 says, Come and see the place where the Lord lay. 
This is not just a blind faith, but a faith that is built on fact. The angel gives an invitation to examine the claims of the resurrection of Jesus. The body of Jesus was placed in a tomb by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. They placed the body in the tomb together. And they bound the body of Jesus in strips of linen with spices as with, was the custom. Now the spices, they weighed about, uh, about 100 pounds. That's about 45.35 kilograms, or 7.14 stone in weight. The large amount of spices and myrrh was extravagant. Probably costed an arm and a leg, it wasn't cheap. But it shows how Joseph and Nicodemus, they loved Christ. They were in awe of this man with immense respect and had found salvation in Christ. And so they anoint the body of, of Jesus. Just like Mary in John 12, when she anointed Jesus, Jesus' feet with a pounding weight of spikenard and wiped his feet with her hair. Now, Mary and Mary Magdalene were expecting to find Jesus in the garden tomb, and they are asked to check it out for themselves. Come and see. Look inside. Did the tomb still have the smell of spices and myrrh in the air? As evidence that Jesus had been there? We don't know. But Jesus' body... Was it stolen? No way. The body could not have been stolen because Pilate made sure that the tomb was guarded. He instructed the tomb to be absolutely secure. Roman soldiers outside the tomb are trained for battle. They're trained to fight as a team. But they were no match for an angel of the Lord. And these soldiers then had to be bright and then spread a lie. They had to say they all fell asleep and the disciples stole the body of Jesus. So the disciples had to roll back up a slope, a two ton stone, carry off the body of Jesus with an additional weight of seven stone of spice he was wrapped in. The Roman guards who are trained fighters must have been sleeping with cotton wool in their ears for that to happen. For the disciples to steal Jesus' body was impossible. It would have been a suicide mission. They would have been cut down before they even got to the stone. None of them would have survived. And logically, you would think the disciples then would have been arrested later on for body snatching. Because somehow they all know who stole the body of Christ. The elders do not want the Roman soldiers telling people Jesus is risen. And what they actually experienced when Jesus rose and they encountered the angel whose face was shining like, like lightning. Very similar description to the Ancient of Days in Daniel chapter 7. And the angel says, come and see where the Lord lay is a challenge to us, to us all, to look into the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the angel here in verse 6, he also said, he also gives a challenge to experience. Come and see. See here means to know. Jesus not only wants you to believe in the resurrection, but he wants you to know him, 
to experience him in a personal and a profound way. And and that's what's so radical, I find, about Christianity. We can get in alone with the Lord in in our bedroom, and we can experience and encounter the Lord. And then at certain points in the history of the church, with times of revival, everybody's experiencing Jesus at the same time, with the same intensity, on the same level, where churches are open 24 hours, and men and women are even praising and worshipping God in the streets, and getting right with Him. And the incredible thing is, sometimes when that happens, they've had no intention to worship Christ. But Christ has come, and they have met with Him, And they know that they know that he is real. In one place I I know of where revival broke out. And they said, who told you to come? And they said, we dreamt it. We had a dream and the Lord told us to come here. And I've seen the video footages of it all. And and you, you see these people coming over the hill, coming to the church to get right with God. Because the Spirit of God bears witness to the resurrection of Christ. And it's true for us. Have we seen Jesus physically? Probably not. But have we experienced the Holy Spirit coming and speaking to our heart, speaking to our mind and to our soul, bearing witness that Christ has risen from the dead? What is it that causes us to weep and mourn and grieve over our sin? It's the holy presence of the Holy Spirit. And we know that we're forgiven because Christ has risen from the dead and he's conquered sin, death and the devil so that we may go free. Because the resurrection of Christianity is foundational. It is fundamental to the Christian faith. And we have this message to proclaim. In 2017, a UK religious survey was taken by, dare I say it, the BBC. I know you can't believe everything you hear on the BBC, but this was a survey they did in 2017 to discover what people believed. And what they came up with was 17% of the people they interviewed believed in the resurrection, that it actually happened word for word as the Bible said, 17%. 26% said, I believe, but the content should not be taken literally. I can't quite get my head around that. (laughs) But 50% said there was no resurrection. 6% said they didn't know. And 46% said, I believe in life after death, reincarnation, heaven and hell. The angel's message is, Christ is risen. And Jesus wants you to know, look at the evidence, look at the facts, look at the eyewitness accounts. And have you met with him? Have you met with the Lord? Have you invited the risen Saviour, Christ, into your heart? To save you from spiritual death. To save you from spiritual blindness. To save you from the spiritual lie. Everything's alright. You've been a good person. Everything will be fine. If you acknowledge, if if your knowledge of Jesus begins with a baby in a manger and ends up with bunnies and eggs, something's gone terribly wrong. You've got the wrong preacher in the pulpit then you need to know that there's more. And there's more. (laughs) There's so much more to the story. The story that is true, that Jesus has risen from the dead. And you can walk with him, and you begin, if you like, that adventure of faith. Because it's not boring. It's not dark. You know, I, I expect God to work in my life 
in and through me and all around me. I want the Holy Spirit show, to show me what God is doing and to be a part of that. Why? Because Jesus has risen from the dead. And once we have experienced the resurrection and know Jesus died for our sin and rose again, what are we commanded to do? Go and tell others. See, we've seen the empty tomb, if you like. We know Jesus is real. And then it's quick, go, tell others. The angelic message to these ladies was imperative. It was of vital importance. Verse 7, the ladies must go and go quickly and tell others without delay. These ladies, with good news, were commanded to go with a sense of urgency to tell the disciples Jesus is risen from the dead. The message of the resurrection is a call to action, to engage in work for the Lord. The message of the empty tomb is still the message of come and see and go quickly and tell. Why is this message so urgent? We all have to be involved with it. It's because people are dying. Thousands every day die without knowing Jesus. It's imperative. It's urgent. If we don't tell, how will they hear? You know, we, we reach the lost with the good news. Christ has risen. Even if over half the population doesn't believe in the resurrection, we must tell them all the more and go quickly. It's totally selfish to keep such good news to ourselves. Because we're robbing others of salvation, we're robbing others of hope, or of life, of joy in the Lord, of an adventure of faith. People today, yes, are spiritually blind to the things of God. The only thing we can do is share the good news, share the gospel, and pray that God opens their eyes and their hearts to the living reality of who Jesus Christ is. As Peter said in Acts 4.12, Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The gospel brings us out of spiritual blindness. The gospel brings people out of despondency. Go quickly and tell his dis the di disciples. The, di <clears throat> the disciples were despondent. They were downcast. They were in grief. They were in turmoil. The disciples were hiding behind closed doors in fear, in trembling, in grief. It was imperative that they hear that Jesus is alive, that he is risen, to stir them up, to bring them out of their despair, and their discouragement, their disheartenedness. The joy it must have brought to those disciples and of course Jesus' mother must have been absolutely overjoyed seeing her son back from the dead. People who do not know the risen Jesus, they've got no hope. It's this emptiness. Life is mediocre. Life is mundane. They think this is all there is to life and go to the grave and, and that's the end. But knowing Jesus, it brings life. It brings life to the full. And the amazing thing is, when you step out and you tell others that you're a believer and you share something of Christ, that life of the resurrection, at times you, you know it in you. There's a joy there. There's something that wells up because you've received the life of Christ and you're sharing the life of Christ. And His living water, His life flows through us because He is the way and the truth and the life. 
and these ladies go to the disciples. They meet Jesus, verse 9. And Jesus, as he met them, he says, rejoice. And they worship. And they take hold of Jesus' feet. And they love him. And really, at the core of worship, that, I guess that's what it is. It's loving Jesus. And they're just so in awe. That here is Jesus meeting with them and he's saying rejoice. And rejoice here meaning in Greek means favorably disposed. Leaning toward. And when we meet with Christ what do we do? We worship. We rejoice. We lean toward. We delight in God's grace. Rejoice also means to delight in God's grace, to literally experience God's favour and to be consciously aware of it and to be glad. Rejoice is when joy and grace come together and we meet the joy and the grace coming together in Christ as we experience his resurrection and know him. We can know this rejoicing by knowing Jesus who lifts us out of despondency, lifts us out of blindness and sets us free. As these ladies encounter the risen Christ, fear gets pushed away, gets pushed to one side. The fear is replaced with joy as they rejoice. And we proclaim Christ on this day and we go out declaring Jesus has risen from the dead. Because the world is watching the church at the moment. The world is watching us. And this world doesn't need another definition of Christianity. What this world needs is a demonstration of Christianity. It needs a demonstration of Christianity. And that happens as we encounter the risen Christ and our lives are transformed and we live for him. So are we willing To surrender all to Christ and say, Father, you have raised your son from the dead. May he live within me, purify me, sanctify me, justify me, make me right with you. So I can stand in these days rejoicing in the glory of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and know his life flowing through and out through me and touching others. It's Lord, here I am. Let me be your vessel in this circumstance, in this situation for your glory. I keep my eyes on you because you are coming back and the world is watching to see how we live. And as we live in a way that has been touched by the resurrection of Christ, so it brings glory to God the Father. We enter into this relationship with the Godhead, with the Blessed Trinity. And it's intimate, and it's personal, and he meets us where we are at as we surrender all, as we say, yes, I know. My Saviour has risen from the dead and he lives within my heart and one day he will resurrect me to himself for his glory. Amen.
for the victory of Christ in that mighty resurrection day. And Father, make it a living reality to each and every one of us. Meet us, Lord, where we are at. Transform us, Lord, with the power of the resurrection. And may we share this story that is true wherever we go for thy glory. Empower us, Lord, and let your hand rest upon us now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen.